best people, best conversations. We're on a journey and it's just getting started. All right, everybody, we are live. You are back. I am Jack Murphy. This is the Jack Murphy Live podcast. And today I have a guest from somebody right in my backyard from Loudoun County, Virginia, Mr. Ian Pryor. How are you doing today, bud? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Yeah, my pleasure. So here's why we're talking. Ian Pryor is a parent and an activist and an all around motivated man trying to get some things done in Loudoun County, Virginia, which is home of one of the worst critical race theory circumstances that we have come across uh, in this country. Not only is Loudoun County, Virginia, uh, one of the worst cases, but so is Virginia, state of Virginia, all kinds of things coming down the pipe from them of like eliminating advanced math and keeping people grouped in the same level of math all the way up until almost 10th or 11th grade, I believe, in high school. All kinds of self-immolation and terrible things happening, which is ironic in one of the richest, whitest counties in all of the land. Everyone who lives in Loudoun County moved there for the schools. And now apparently everybody who did that is anti-racist, even though their actions speak louder than words. That's my favorite one about how they move there for the schools. But they're not racist. I promise. I promise. So, Ian, give me a little bit of background. Uh, Let's just take a couple of minutes. Who are you? You live in Loudoun. How did this come to your attention? And then we will just go from there. Yeah. So briefly, uh, you know, I'm from Rhode Island, Uh, grew up there. Went to college and law school, Boston University, uh, was a lawyer for kind of the first 10 years of, of my career. Uh, and then then I got into the you know political field. I, I helped run a race in a uh, congressional race in Rhode Island in 2012. That was sort of my first political experience whatsoever. Moved down here in 2013, uh, got an opportunity to go work at the National Republican Congressional Committee in their communications department. Um. Stayed there for about two years. Moved over to, over to a Senate Leadership Fund for two years and then went over to the Department of Justice, where I was the Deputy Director of Public Affairs from 2017 to 2018, which, as you can imagine, would have been an interesting time to be uh, doing public affairs at the Department of Justice. Gotcha. Uh, so after that, you know, I just decided um, to, to go into the private sector, was at a firm for a little while, you know, it was kind of corporate comms work, a little bit boring. Um, but then I just opened up my own my own PR firm and have been doing that. Um, you know, this this thing really, for me, kind of ebbed and flowed. Uh, I think it was last September, you know, I, I dug into a little bit what was going on in, in Loudoun County Public Schools with the, the Equity Collaborative, which is this consulting company out in California. And I learned that they had paid them, you know, something like $500,000 uh, over the course of 2019 to run focus groups, to create this, this equity report, which is, you know, of course, cited by every publication as this groundbreaking report. And I learned some things that, that were interesting. They did focus groups with parents. They excluded Asian and, and Caucasian parents from that. Um, they had a bunch of things in there that were really anecdotal and they used those anecdotes to try and create data, which it just didn't work. Uh, and then, you know, they obviously the spending, but now they're still on contract for $625 an hour, this group. And, you know, I wrote an, an article in The Federalist about that, along with some other things, you know, that I saw coming out of the schools. They had a professional code of conduct for teachers where teachers couldn't couldn't speak out even in private, even in their own neighborhoods about what was going on in the schools. And then there was a, a dress code that was really overbroad talking about, you know, you couldn't wear anything that would be deemed offensive, which, you know, that seems like an overbroad, vague First Amendment issue. Uh, and then I ended up going to a school board meeting in October spoke at that school board meeting really just about the First Amendment issues. And, and that was kind of it. And then March comes around and you've got this this private Facebook group called the Anti-Racist Parents of Loudoun County. Uh, you had six school board members in there. You had the Commonwealth Attorney for Loudoun County in there. You had one of the members of the Board of Supervisors in there. And was one school board member in particular really incited this sort of online mob, which led to you know a call to action well, saying, hey, we on. need to... Let, let, let's let's set this up a little bit more because this okay. is this is huge. Okay, this is yeah. this is not something that I want us to talk about and let slide back. I want to set this up a little bit more. First of all, let me ask you a question: You got students in Loudoun County, or you have kids in Loudoun County? Yep, I've got a uh, rising third grader and rising first grader. Okay, so you're personally invested in the fact that your kids live in the county, and we're talking about their education, education of your community members, their friends, and people that you associate with, right? 
Absolutely. Okay, perfect. You're not just a, you're not just an outside agitator. You're not just a Trump appointed DOJ guy coming in to raise hell and screw everything up for everybody, right? Nope. Okay, good. That's good to get that out right away. Second thing is, is let's talk about this hit list. Okay. That is what first got my attention to say that the things that are happening in Loudoun County are worse than other places, right? So all over the country, we've seen the critical race uh, practice, applied practice, right? Because they're not exactly getting up there and saying, here's the definition of critical race theory, and this is what it means. What they're So they're actually doing the practice of critical race theory, what it teaches in their day-to-day education of the children. So that's one very important point and distinction to make. Loudoun County is worse partially because of this hit list. Let's let's back up. There is a Facebook group designed. What is its mission? What is its goal? How did you discover it? And then let's talk about who is on it, and then let's talk about what they've been doing. Because, guys, this part is the mind-blowing part to me, in addition to all the crazy. So I, I don't know how it got discovered. It was a Friday afternoon. You know, I'm sitting on my computer, and somebody texts this over, to me. And, and it was, you know, I'm like, oh, that's, that's interesting. Uh, I didn't know I was on it. I looked at it. I saw some screenshots. I saw the, the, you know, the one where it talked about infiltrating, exposing, hacking people's websites. And, you know, my radar went right up at that point. I said, well, that's, that's a solicitation of a crime right there. Okay. Hold on. Hold on. And we're, we're talking as if people already know what we're talking about. They don't. There is a Facebook group made up of teachers, administrators, political officials, elected officials, appointed officials who have put together a list of parents who have been critical of critical race theory and its applied practice. And they've they've made a list of the bad people. And then they have directed directly targeted these people through various measures such as spamming their websites, hacking their website. Tell, tell me what these measures have been. So what they said in the, in the call to action was we need to infiltrate their groups. We need to publicly expose them. We need to hack their websites and redirect people to pro critical race theory websites. And we need to raise money for this. That is, inc- that is incredible. There are public officials there are teachers and administrators, there are parents getting together and saying, we need to hack these people's websites. We need to disrupt their information flow. We need to basically damage them, shame them, and and, and humiliate them in order to get them to fall in line with our desires. Is that right? That sums it up. And how how did that make you feel as a parent in Loudoun County when you realize that your teachers, administrators, and political officials are putting together a, a hit list of opponents and urging their membership to take action against you? I you know, I think what it made me feel was in that that first sort of tranche of activity where I wrote that article for the Federalist, it's that's exactly why I was trying to point that out because this is what the result is going to be. When you start pushing this stuff in schools, you're gonna start seeing it bleed out through kids trying to cancel each other. And now you've got parents trying to cancel each other because somebody disagrees with them. And they're not only going after parents, are they, are they harassing the children of these parents as well? That I don't know, but I, I do know that when you put my name on a list, you know, you're not just putting my name on a list, you're putting my two kids names on the list, especially when you've got teachers in there, administrators, and, you know, are they going to look at those kids of the people that were listed and say, that kid's a problem, his parents are a problem, we got to keep an eye on those kids. Uh, You may know Christopher Rufo, Uh, he and I had coffee a few months ago, when we were talking about his experience living on the West Coast in the big city, and he ran for a local political office back, uh, back a few years ago. And when the same type of people we're talking about here found out about Chris and they found out about his views on things, this was before he had blown up as a Twitter personality or Twitter activist, they not only harassed him, harassed him at his work, 
But they found out where his kids played on what playgrounds, and they went and they harassed his children directly on the playground. Now, to me, that's some serious, serious, serious fighting words. Like the, you stepping to my kids and bringing my kids physically into this, talking about them is one thing, you know, but physically bringing my kids into it, that is really crossing crossing the line. Did you sense amongst your your parent community and your neighbors and whomever, like was was there a visceral reaction to knowing that there was this hit list on parents or did some people be like, Oh, well, you know, it's just part of the process or how did, how did the people <laughs> around you react? It was pretty visceral. I, you know, obviously that made news right off the bat. And I think there was kind of chaos, I, you know, cause a lot of the people that were put on that list weren't even there for speaking out against critical race theory. A lot of the people, I think most of the people had been going to school board members to try and get schools reopened. Mm. And so it became much bigger than just this one sliver of policy. It became, oh, if you go and speak at a school board meeting and you take a position opposite from the schools, you're now on this list. And that really sort of galvanized people to get together and try and figure something out. I mean, putting people on lists is is a common theme of this regime. We've just had Joe Biden and the press secretary telling us that they're literally putting people on lists. And then at the same time, they're telling us that they've expanded the powers of the Capitol Police, who are unfoyable, by the way, putting billions of dollars in their pockets, the Capitol Police, and opening offices all across the country to track down people who they put on this list. I mean... If you, you say it out loud like that, it sounds like you're making it up. It sounds fake. It sounds like it came from a different era, a different country, a different planet. It's a bad movie. But it's not. This is real life. Your name as a parent is on a list of people who want to destroy you because you're standing in the way of them advancing their communist, Marxist, racist, misogynistic, whatever philosophy that has no no end goal in sight but to take power and destroy people along the way. Was there an outrage? Did did people push you to the forefront? Did you step up on your own? Are you on the forefront? Who else is out there? Like, how are people responding on the ground? Part of what I want people to take away from this conversation is to, A, understand exactly what's happening from parents on the ground in the middle of the, sh of the shit. But then also to be inspired motivated and hopefully a little bit of education along the way here as we get to it about what to do and how they can fight back like are people pushing you yeah so are i there think other people around what's going on there i think what what motivated me at first was you know the idea that hey i can go out and push back on this right you know i work in politics i'm not going to get canceled but there are a lot of people on that list that you know they can't go out and speak out so my first instinct was go get in front of it like embrace it, you know, get on offense, don't play defense, get on offense. You know, a reporter had called me and told me I was on the list. And, you know, once that story broke, it's exposed this because this could be happening in other people's neighborhoods too. Yeah. Uh, what, what we did was we really took a bunch of parents, I'd say maybe eight parents, and we went out and we, we sat on someone's back deck at the, maybe the next week or maybe a week and a half after and said, all right, well, this is ridiculous. I mean, you know, as bad as it is that you have, you know, members of your community target, targeting their own neighbors, what's even worse is that you have elected officials, one of which really started the fire and the other five did nothing. They did absolutely nothing. They didn't put out a statement. They didn't apologize. They didn't reach out to their constituents and say, hey, listen, I, you know, I'm sorry about this. This is wrong. They didn't put a statement in that group saying, everybody, you guys need to shut this down. And so I think that is where the, the sort of the grassroots operation came into being because, you know, I, nobody really wants to spend time getting in neighborhood fights. But when you've got the government involved, I think that's a different story. And so we started a pack. We we looked at the law. We looked at the the circumstances, and we said, "Well, we're going to recall these six school board members that were in there." Okay. So and we've the, been we've been at it since the recall of the six school board members. That is based on the CRT stuff. That's based on them being dumbasses when it comes to reopening schools and mask mandates and whatever else. Or is it all of the above, or what? Uh, actually, you know, it's you could say the genesis of the frustration with the school board is on those issues. But 
for there's for the the actual removal effort which has to go to court the argument is there were six school board members in a private facebook group that's a quorum that means you have to follow virginia open meetings law and it was also a forum that was limited based on your viewpoint which means that's a violation of the first amendment and then there's a whole host of code of conduct issues that we can throw in there as well yeah. so we have a very targeted legal argument as to why the very core functions of this school board have been compromised by their actions and now they, they have no trust in the community do they have a fiduciary responsibility the board members well absolutely i mean they represent us right, right. And this is a representative democracy this is right. not an oligarchy this is not a you know dictatorship they represent us and you know you look through their code of conduct and it's it's all there and they violated it six ways to sunday Right. And even so, fiduciary responsibility uh, explicitly has higher standards of care than most contractual relationships, et cetera. Isn't that right? You're a lawyer. Can you explain a little bit of that to the audience, please? Yeah. So, you know, it's, you know, if you look and talking about negligence, everybody has a duty to act reasonably. But if, say, you're someone's financial advisor, you have to go beyond acting reasonably. You have a special position of trust that you have to view your relationship with. And if you violate that trust, then you breached your fiduciary duty and you can be held legally accountable to that. Yeah, fascinating. I wonder if the fiduciary breach is a vector for this stuff across the country, actually. Especially if, uh, man, all of them getting together and acting in a concerted effort against the parents that they're supposed to represent. That is, what kind of hubris? And arrogance, that's the part about all this that it rubs me so hard is the fact that people are acting with such, they just think that they're untouchable or that they can do whatever they want or that the rules don't apply to them or, or whatever, or that they're going to just be in control of the gulag at the end of the day. So it doesn't even matter what they do or how to comply or anything like that, man, it is maddening. All right. Tell me about the pack. Or should we talk about the PAC first or should we talk about the actual school board meetings where people are singing the national anthem and protesting and getting arrested and whatever else? Like, you tell me yeah. which order to talk Let's about. Let's talk about the school board meetings because I, I think it's fascinating. You know, it's, it's a really interesting story how these things develop. We've, we've really been able to kind of plan and, you know, talk about different issues and do it in a way that's, that's going to garner attention. And we, you know, we plan that going into school board meetings. So the, the first one that I think really was, was well-planned was when the moms were exposing some of the books that were being read in ninth grade. And they had the, you know, the um, poster boards with the language on it and they were reading it. And that was great and it got a lot of coverage. But what also got a lot of coverage was a woman named Chantel Cooper who got up there. You know, most people didn't know who she was at that point in time. And she's a, a black mom of biracial children, and she gave an amazing speech, and it went completely viral, right? And it's like, wow, well, now we know. Now we all know Chantel Cooper, and she's part of the team. And then, you know, the next week, we had a press conference, and we we're, you know, kind of exposing some of the, the misrepresentations from what we've seen from the school board and the superintendent. And you've got Tanner Cross goes in to, to speak at the school board meeting. And, you know, some people heard him speak, some people didn't, didn't really make a ton of you know, news at that time until two days later when he goes on administrative leave and it opens up a whole new coalition of people that are looking at this school board and saying, what are you doing? And then the, the then after that, you know, they then they opened it up so that people could actually sit in the school board meetings. And you had Xi Van Fleet uh, from China, who lived through the Cultural Revolution, gave another what became a viral speech explaining how this is very much like Mao's revolution. And then finally, the last school board meeting, what did they do? Right. They turned the cameras around so that, that the speakers wouldn't get any camera time because they're like, we don't need another viral moment at the Loudoun mm -hmm. County School Board. And instead, they ended up getting a trending moment and a national story when they decided to shut down public comment because of applause, which, you know, I say that's I've looked at the case law and applause is a form of expression and it is a First Amendment right as long as, as it is not, you know, fully disruptive. And I don't think it was fully disruptive at all. Right. That's fascinating. So you guys have a plan of action. You guys laid out strategy, approach, 
your tactics, you operationalized it. Did you recruit these moms? Did you recruit the moms to come, you know, make these presentations? Like taking the, taking the books that they're teaching, putting them on the quotes on poster boards, putting it up there for people to see, making them read it out loud and like sit with it. It was just something that you guys planned. Is that an emergent thing? Is that something that you guys trained them up on? How, how, how did that work? No, you know, I think we have so many great people that have, that have sort of joined the movement that we've all gotten to know as this, as this thing happened. And I think once we heard about that book and I don't know who it was said, oh, wow, it'd be pretty effective if we just read some of the, the passages from these books at the school board meeting. I mean, they're going to be they're going to be shocked. And then another mom said, well, what if we all read different passages and we do it all in a row? And then another mom says, what if we get some some poster boards, too? And that's really how the plan develops. It's a it's a collaborative effort where you're using people's different skills and ideas. You know, it, it's funny because I always see these these folks on the other side saying this is some top down effort. And, you know, they always like to point to me like I'm this, you know, Machiavelli Republican operative. But really, all these ideas come from different people. And then we're able to operationalize it by collaborating and, you know, testing the uh, the impact on it. That's fascinating. I, I think that you probably do have a target on your back, given your professional background, your training, who you worked for, et cetera. I mean, but really it just means that you're equipped and experienced and you've been through the battles and you know how this stuff works, you know, how messaging works and you know how to, how to make people trip over themselves. So that, I mean, they're very lucky to have somebody like you that's not only helping them, but still feeling passionate about it. I mean, these are your kids. This is your neighborhood. This is your community. Uh, side note, did you ever think that this would happen when you moved to Loudoun County, Virginia, of all places? I mean, come on. No, I, ne you know, I've never done anything locally, right? Like local activity, sort of community organizing. Never, never thought I would, never done it before, but it just sort of popped up. And I will say that, you know, there was already a movement here before all this stuff happened with the with the closed schools issue. And so it was, you know, easy to figure out who is, you know, who has been leading this effort. And so you've got a bunch of different leaders, a bunch of different groups. And what happened in March with that that Facebook group is it sort of unified two different coalitions. And then again, going back to the Tanner Cross issue, well, that brought another coalition in. And so you're meeting all these people that are well connected in their community and everybody is, is really fighting for the same cause, which is to you know, take back our schools on behalf of our children. And it's, it's really been I mean, it's been amazing how we've all been able to come together uh, through this moment. Well, if there's one thing that will unite people, it's protecting their children. Right. I mean, that's a pretty, oh, that, that is a very intense connection that you can make with other people. And even if you didn't get along with them before, even if you don't care to hang out with them in the future, if your kids are suffering from the same risks uh, and the same negative effect, negative side effects, you'll come together and you'll, and you'll work on it and you'll get it going. So I really appreciate that. Um, I would like to hear a little bit more about this. The, there was the moment where we saw where people were in the school board meeting. Now, let me ask you a question before we get there. The, the venue for the school board's meetings I saw as like a big auditorium. Is that how it always was? Or have they changed venues because there's been more people showing up? It, that's how it always has been. But the last two school board meetings are the only ones since the pandemic where everybody was allowed in. So previously, you know, one wow. person would go up to the podium, your mask would slip off, the chairwoman would yell at you, you'd speak for a minute and then you leave. Right, right. Well, it was a much different scene the last time I saw a clip. Talk us through the scene with the national anthem. Start from the beginning. How did this happen? What happened? Tell us about the police involvement. T tell us, tell us through the whole story and pretend we don't know anything about it. Well, so I have a different perspective because I, I wasn't even there. Um, oh, we, we had talked beforehand and this kind of goes into how we plan things. And, you know, we had learned that they were going to bus people in, they were going to bus in the, you know, AFL CIO Planned Parenthood. Uh, the, the Loudoun Democrats had tweeted it. One of the school board members retweeted it. So we said, well, OK, look, they're looking for they're looking for controversy here. Let's zig while they zag. 
And we held a press conference before we announced where we were on numbers. And we said, we're going to take 30 people and we're going to go into Leesburg, Virginia, which is the district of one of the school board members. And while the school board meeting is going on, we're going to go door to door getting signatures. So I was with, with another one of the volunteers and I had it on my phone. And we were watching all these speeches with people who were signing petitions on mm. my phone. Mm. It was it was phenomenal. They're like, is that the school board meeting right now? We'd be standing there for like 10 minutes watching the watching the meeting with them. So from that perspective, I think what we saw was they really tried to um, stack the school board meeting with people that were pro school board, pro critical race theory, pro transgender policies. And it worked for about 17 speakers. And then they kind of ran out. And that's when it was parent after parent after parent just protesting everything that the school had been doing. And then when you get to um, when you get to former Senator Dick Black, who gives his speech, he gets, you know, rousing applause. They shut the meeting down and then they, then it, the, the, the feed cuts. Right. And so now I'm getting all these videos sent to me by people that are still there. And like, look, here's what's going on. They're, they're you know, singing the national anthem tweet that out right um then there was uh there was a, a couple of moments where people just started giving their own public comments in the school board meeting even though the school board uh, members had left and then you know the superintendent he's the one that comes out and says this is an unlawful assembly and at that point you know the sheriff's office really had no choice um based on the superintendent's order and you know people started to leave one person you know protested it he wasn't you know he didn't do anything other than that you know he got cited for trespass and then there was another individual who you know we, we see what we saw on tv and the pictures but they were really antagonizing this gentleman i mean they were getting up in his face he, you know they're trying to create a conflict which is really what they do uh and then i guess people were out there for um for a little while after and then i just put a bunch of calls in and said well, I guess I guess we got some more door knockers that just freed up. So we had about another 10 people come out to Leesburg and start knocking on more doors. And so, you know, we are always looking to 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 think about what they're doing because they're very much in opposition to their own constituents. And we keep we don't want to play their game. Um, so we want to make sure that we're effective and we zig when they zag. Man, so, so much great stuff in there. I love the fact that you guys are thinking like that a couple steps ahead. It's what it takes. And this is a great example of the iteration competition that we're in. You have to evolve your tactics in response to the evolution of the tactics of the person that you're engaged with. We saw this all last summer with Antifa, BLM and the cops and the way that Trump, you know, first at first when they there was a protest, they didn't block off Lafayette Square. So there was a huge conflict. Then they block it off and they build a fence that changes. There's little tweaks to the to the conflict every single time. So then things change and they move over to different neighborhoods. And instead of being concentrated on the White House, then they start BLM starts going out into the neighborhood, start harassing people who are dining. And then you just have to keep iterating and iterating. And for me, that iteration was I'm no longer going out to dinner anywhere where people can just walk up to me on the street and start demanding that I raise the fist. So if you're a business in DC and you're not going to defend your patrons from being harassed by people coming off the sidewalk, well, I'm not going. Anyway, this is more about the iteration and, and the side that iterates fastest may win at the end of the day. This is very clearly Antifa tactics fun fused with BLM tactics and CRT. They're all on the same team. They're all reading from the same script. They're all doing the same thing. And it is it's kind of scary to see. It's kind of scary to see. I can hear somebody in, in my mind saying, well, not every school district's going to have a professional communications guy on staff to help fight back, right? Like not every group is going to have a trained political operative like yourself in order, in order to fight back against it. What do you say to somebody like that? How do you inspire and motivate others to take action who may not have the same background and skills that you do? Well, you know, that's interesting because that's certainly how, how it started, right? Because it's, all right, I know how to, how to get, you know, stories to the right people, but it's not just me anymore. I mean, people have learned as things happen, um, they will start reaching out to other parents. So now you have other parents that can reach out to a, a publication and say, hey, you know, I've got this FOIA doc and I'll see a story pop up and I'll say, well, who, who pitched that one? Okay. <laughs> or, or you've got other moms that are like, can we get this parent on TV? 
And I would say that, you know, for, for the media, having just everyday parents on television to, you know, basically carry a message is more appealing than having someone like me on all the time. And so it, it really is incumbent on, on parents. Look at who's writing the articles on these things. You know, it's always going to be there. You're, you're going to be able to get their email, send them stuff. Just because you think that they they work for a big publication or, you know, they, they're a, a big news organization, they, they'll ignore you. They won't. If you have a story, it doesn't matter who is pitching that story. And, it's, and I think that's one of the things that we've been able to get to, you know, a lot of the parents here and a lot of the parents in other counties, which is you can do this too. Figure out who's writing about this stuff, figure out who's interested in this stuff and just email them. Yeah. Being proactive, guys. That, taking action. Taking action of any kind. Well, not of any kind, but just taking action is like one of the biggest hurdles to overcome. People have imposter syndrome. They don't think that they can actually make it work. They don't think nobody's going to, anybody's going to pick up the call when they do call. But you guys have been very effective. I <laughs> I know my DM inbox is filled up with tweets about, about your guys' work, about what you're doing in different events. And I'm always happy to promote them because this is, this is mission critical. And it's a great example for other people across the country. Guys, if you're wondering why I'm promoting all the stuff about Loudoun County, yes, it's in my own backyard. Yes, I have a particular affinity for uh, for Virginia. Yes, I'm on my way to Middleburg, which is not Loudoun, but a little bit out there, uh, on my way through there just tomorrow. Can't wait. Going to look at wedding sites. It's going to be awesome. Uh, but uh, this is really to, to be an example for other people, for other uh uh, jurisdictions for other people that want to fight back. What people are always asking me, what can I do? What can I do? And one of the main takeaways I'm getting here, and I'll, I'll let you go in a sec. One of the main takeaways I'm getting here is you just got to do something, man. You got to get out there and knock on doors. You got to show up at the board meetings. You got to make phone calls. You have to not be afraid to call a reporter and be like, I have a real story for you. What do you say? Ian? Yeah, that's right. And usually, I mean, I, I, I frame it in these three buckets, which I think is helpful for people to think of, right? And, and bucket number one is you got to investigate, which means use Freedom of Information Act in, you know, um, strategies to find out what is actually going on with your schools. Yes. Who are they signing contracts with? Who are they, how much are they paying? What are they using for teacher trainings? I mean, teacher trainings are really where the, yep. the horrible stuff is coming from. Yep. Um, and then once you've found that, you've got you've to communicate it. And you've got to communicate it to your network, to other parents. Um, and you've got to communicate it to the, to the media where, it, where it's enough of a story. And, you know, it's really easy just to go through, like I said, figure out who's writing about this stuff, create a press list, go get an email system, or you can start off just using your, your Gmail if you need to. And when you start seeing things, you know, send it to yourself, BCC, you know, the 20 reporters that are interested in this, and then you're going to start getting stories and you're going to start figuring out the process. And then the third thing is activate, right? Now, once you've got, once you've shined a light on what is going on in the schools, you got to figure out what is your strategy for change? What, what are your tactics? What are your strategies? And, you know, for us, the, the removal process was really the, the first um, tactic that we think, you know, we've got a good shot at this. But it's not the only thing because we can't, you know, this is a fight that you're not just going to win one thing and say, okay, well, we won. Let's all go home. No, you need to constantly be watching what is going on with your tax dollars that are educating your children. Indeed. This is fantastic. This is what I'm looking for. My producer is going to clip that part and we're going to send that blast out all over the freaking place. Investigate, communicate, activate. That's perfect. This is exactly right. We're running a little seminar here on how to get motivated and how to do things uh, to fight back. And one thing that you mentioned, which is really, really important for people to remember, is that this is going to be an ongoing fight. This is something that is not going to go away. You can't just take a small victory and then go home. This is, if you remember Ricky Tiki Tavi, there's a mongoose and a cobra in the sack, and one of them is coming out. And that's where we are right now. That is where we are. And I, I finally realized this last summer as I'm getting shot in the throat with rubber bullets and people are smashing cops over the head with bricks and I'm watching buildings getting burned down and stores getting looted, old senior citizens getting harassed by mobs of young people. Like I realized finally that we are in a life or death fight to the end. Those folks 
the CRT folks, they are religious zealots and they see you as the devil. And they think that they are compelled to destroy you and everything that you've built and everything that you believe in. And if they don't, that, that, that they're failing their God of whatever it is. That's the perspective that we have to take. And they have taken decades to get to this point, guys, decades, all of the universities, all of the media, all of entertainment, all of news. It is something that has been ongoing, long-term structural in nature, and it is not fleeting. This is not, you're only just hearing about it now because not you, Ian, obviously folks, you're only just hearing about it now because it's reached critical point where it's affecting your children. I've always said that the biggest and most frequent red pill coming to America is at the dinner table. And when you're finding out about what garbage that they're putting into your children's head, that is going to activate mama bears all over the country. You're teaching my kids what? And all of a sudden your 50 hour work week and your little league schedule and your swim team schedule and all these other things that, that had been taken priority, got to get pushed to the side. And first priority has got to be protecting your kids, protecting your kids, investigate, communicate, activate. I love it. Now there's another eight word I'm thinking of, which is educate. To what extent do you believe the common person in Loudoun County has any idea what critical race theory is, what it looks like in practice and what its consequences are? What percentage of the regular folks in Loudoun County actually have any concept of this? Say 40%. Okay, that's a lot. Uh, we did we did a poll in Fairfax and in, in Loudon about a month ago, and we found forty percent, uh, you know, knew about it. The remaining sixty, various levels, I've heard about it, not really sure about it, haven't heard about it. So there's a lot of work to do, and and certainly you're starting to see the messaging change on the other side. I mean, they're kind of all over the place with with their response. You know, it's oh, we don't do critical, we don't teach critical race theory, or well, critical race theory is, is an important way of looking at society and teaching, or you just don't want to teach accurate history. Those are kind of their three messages. Um, and they're always in conflict with each other because no, no one seems to get on the same page as to what they want to say. Mm. Well, it's also because it's ethereal and slippery by design. And the real goal is to take power by any means necessary. And they've, they've just the, the race vector. Okay, this is an important distinction, and I'm going to catch up some crap from the far rioters out there. I don't care. It is anti-white explicitly, but it is not the goal. The goal is not to be anti-white. Anti-whiteness is one of their tactics for the larger strategy of obtaining power. Okay. I don't know how, how we can make this point more obvious to people. And now there's going to be all kinds of arguments. Oh, Jack said it wasn't anti-white. It's anti-white by design, but not by goal. Come on. How hard is that? So, so one of the, one of the big teacher training things that we saw that I think illustrates how much bigger it is than just, you know, anti-white it's, you've got the oppressors here and the oppressed here. And the, you know, the category that really you know, struck me was light skinned individuals of one race are oppressors vis a vis dark skinned individuals of that same race. They're just dividing everywhere they can slice people into these different identity groups so they can then all just put them back into the oppressor, oppressed category. That's your big category. Yep. So they cut it up and they put you in these two categories. Yeah. Yeah. I wrote about this in my book, Democrat to deplorable. I wrote it in, in 2016, published in 2018, this very, very concept about subdivision, subdivision, subdivision. I called it an ever tightening cordon. It's like, eventually there's only going to be one person in the middle saying I'm the oppressed and all of you are oppressors. The true richest irony of all of this is that by the time they get done doing whatever they're doing, the, the group that they're opposed to will be more diverse than the group uh, who is saying that they're oppressed. That part is absolutely hilarious. And that's why I think in my heart that there is, there is a positive outcome to this one day because take into its logical conclusion, this shit is, is doomed. It's just doomed that it, 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 it doesn't create life. It destroys life. And those kind of systems, they fall apart. 
our system creates life. Hopefully it will continue on. This is the thing that uh, I, I want people to begin to understand. And if you're telling me that you think in Loudoun County, you guys have 40% penetration into awareness, that, I think that's actually, that's actually really good. Uh, Loudoun is an interesting purplish county at this point, isn't it? I mean, growing up around here in Northern Virginia, as I did, all I remember about Loudoun County was Leesburg, and it was far away, and it was conservative place. But now with Ashburn blowing up, and like it is, it is a mix. It is really an extended Fairfax County, which is really an extended Washington D.C. Is that right? I mean, do you see that? Is Loudoun purpling? It was red. Is it blue? Like how? What is the mix there? So I can understand this forty percent context. I think we'll get a better sense, you know, this fall, right? I mean, it obviously was blue in twenty twenty. 2018, but it's a different environment now. So I, I think we're going to get a sense of where Loudoun County is in November. Is it truly blue or is it purple? Does it still have, you know, is it a true swing county? You know, I, I don't think you can judge politically, you know, where it went in 2020 and 2018 because of the circumstances of, you know, midterm elections after a new president is elected and then, you know, obviously the, the presidential but now that you're in the, the opposite side of it, where you've got you know, Joe Biden as president and the usual shift back, we'll see. Because if it doesn't shift back, then it's blue. If it does shift back, then I think it remains purple. Right, right. Uh, just to refresh everybody, I'm talking here with Ian Pryor. He is a parent in Loudoun County of two kids who are subjected to the CRT nonsense, the masks and the closings and the social distancing and all that stuff as well. He's an experienced political operator and communications guy, so he's perfect to help lead this charge in conjunction with other people uh, and to help educate folks as to how you can best fight back. Ian, where can people find you on Twitter? Where can they find out more about your cause? Where can they find out more about what you're doing? Yeah, so on Twitter, it's it's at B and D prior, um, but our organization is Fight for Schools. So you can go to fightforschools.com. I think we actually just our, our new website should be done today. I think it's shifted over. Uh, so we you know we have all the all the news items, all of the you know the things that we've been doing, how we've been operating, how we've been setting up you know different events, uh, and you know go there and follow it because I think we're trying to build build the model that other people can take in their own individual states and counties. And just last week, you know, I was down at Texas, I was at CPAC and everywhere I went and talked to people, it was, oh, so where are you from? I said, Loudoun County. Oh, that, ugh. do you have any involvement with the school stuff there? I'm like, I do. <laughs> <laughs> and they, you know, the term I kept hearing was Lexington and Concord. They're like, that, that's the Lexington mm. and Concord of, of the parents revolution. Interesting. I like that. What is the, oh man, what year does that put us in? Like 1770 or something? I don't know. 1775. Yeah, 1775. Oh, shit. Okay. Well, that's a, that, that advances my time, my timeline a little bit using that analogy. Uh, but no, you're absolutely right about needing to set an example and create a framework that can be replicated. Okay. Who else are you? in contact with what other networks are you working with because if you're not bro let's get on that i'm sure you are but who who are you connected <laughs> yeah, you know, been, who are you connected to out there we've you know we've been talking to people all over the country but certainly in virginia we've been talking to the the fairfax parents we've i've been talking to people down in chesterfield henrico um it's just now with county somebody reached out so i think it's kind of building county by county here but certainly nationally, you know, a bunch of different groups. I know 1776 Action has been has been involved in this um, from a national perspective. We've talked to them a bunch. Uh, you know, it's it's despite what what our opponents here like to say, nobody's running this except the parents on the ground. But we're certainly talking to these individuals because and these organizations because they're looking at what we're doing and saying, "Geez, they're really they're really being effective with how they're doing this." We need to figure out what they're doing and, and get them to help us help parents everywhere. So those are conversations I have all the time. We've gotten you know so many emails from across the country too, asking these exact questions. How do we do what you're doing? And that's kind of where I, I figured out the, all right, I got three words. That's the whole activate, you know, investigate, communicate, activate, um, because it's a real easy concept to, to think of and just sort of watch what, what we're doing, watch what Fairfax County is doing. I mean, they've been successful as well. 
and you know, it's, it, you just got to work hard at it too. The other thing that, that we say all the time with our, you know, what one, we've got an army of moms and they are at it all day, every day. And you, you know, you have to motivate people. You've got to figure out ways to motivate people and build a team and, and really just, you know, you work with each other and you support each other and it becomes a support network. Everybody has their own roles and responsibilities. You've got lawyers, you've got marketing people, you've got people that have worked in government contracting that know where to find the, the necessary items to, you know, for that investigation piece. So, you know, it's finding those people in your community that are invested, that are smart, skilled, articulate, and can work as part of a team. Yes. <laughs> Well, you've just narrowed the population down to about 0.001%. <laughs> but I do hear what you're saying. Absolutely 100%. And I think that uh, once people feel the direct impact on their children, that will motivate people in a way that other sort of just conversations and, and intellectual exercises can do. It is certainly a different experience when you find out that your five-year-old daughter is going to sit with her whiteness and feel the discomfort of the circumstances and be told that her discomfort, her internal voice telling her to run away should be discarded because she's white and she has to sit with her discomfort. Oh, to the point of, so when she's older, she will yield positions of power to people of color. Do you guys think I'm making this shit up? It sounds crazy, but I'm not. It's all straight out of the fucking literature. Okay. It's like you just repeating back to the other people what they're saying. You're repeating back what they're saying. And it sounds so absurd. It sounds like you're lying. I remember I interviewed uh, back when Aaron Danielson was murdered by Antifa in, uh, in last summer. I interviewed a guy who was on the ground filming the entire thing. Okay. And he claimed that he was just an innocent bystander who just happened to pick it up on camera and that he started going to these uh, Portland protests because his daughter got involved with Black Lives Matter. This is a white guy got involved in Black Lives Matter, et cetera. And, uh, and, I, was, and I was like, you're a dad, right? Yeah. Uh, you value your family. Yeah. You think it's important that you're a dad and you have a family. Yeah. Well, did you know that black lives matters aims to disrupt the nuclear family? No, no, that can't be right. So live on the interview. Okay. Live on the interview. I went to the website and I read it to them and he says, oh, that's just gotta be a mistake. That's just a typo. That's just bad copy. Like, bro, it's on the website and part of their mission that they want to disrupt people like you and your family because they think that you're a problem. Uh, no response. I don't watch much TV, but I did watch a little bit of Westworld and it was like about these androids that didn't know that they were yep. androids. And if you show them a plan that lays, that describes like, like the blueprints of how they were built, they just can't, they can't see it. It's like programmed into them. It's sort of the same thing. You can hold up. It, it, it says right here that they want your little girl to be uncomfortable, to disregard her psychological instincts of running away and protecting herself all for the goal of her stepping aside and yielding positions of power to people of color. No, that's, that's can't be right. It's in the Smithsonian. I don't know if you remember that one. I don't know if you remember mm -hmm. that one, but they put it up and right there at the farthest bubble was the yield positions of power thing. I'll never forget that because they took it down. <laughs> they took it down because... <gasps> They had shined the light and the cockroaches were scurrying. Oh, I shouldn't use that. Delete, 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 delete. That's a bad analogy. I'm going to get in trouble for that one. But the point is, is your investigate, communicate, activate plan is effective. I like the shortness. Under investigate, FOIA, Freedom of Information Act. Generally speaking, you can reach out to any of your state and federal agencies and demand that they send you all the documents on certain subjects. Guess what? They... They don't, it's not just documents. I did the FOIA request to the DC public charter school board here in DC. And because I was on the inside, I know what questions to ask. Not only is it the, the documents, the, the proposals, the contracts, it's the agendas, it's the attendance lists, it's the written communications and follow-up and feedback that came afterwards. It's the budget, the budget planning process, the notes from the budget planning process. It is the conference calls in which at any time that these words were uttered and spoken, it is all of the electronic community. I mean, like, there's ways that they hide this stuff and you just have to have a comprehensive list of things to ask for so that they cannot avoid it. Communicate. 
get in touch with the parents, get in touch with the media, create a press list, start disseminating this information, activate, develop a strategy, your tactics and your operations. You guys are being a terrific example. What is next for you at this point? And how are you going to keep moving things forward in Loudoun? And how are you going to begin, if you're not already, I'm sorry for pushing you, how are you going to begin rolling this out nationwide, bro? Because we, this is just like what I'm doing with the liminal order. It's one piece of the greater package that has to happen. What's next? Yeah, that's a great question. And we, we actually talked about it last night. And I'll tell you a story that I heard last week. It's about Sam Adams, right? And somebody said to Sam Adams, hey, Sam, what happens when you have vanquished all your adversaries and you've won the fight and there are no more fights? And he said, well, human nature being what it is, the minute I vanquish my adversaries and win the fight, I will have new adversaries and a new fight. Indeed. And so, you know, our focus has been on going out there and gathering these signatures and if we're able to remove these school board members, well, then the new fight becomes a special election. Mm -hmm. Now, let's say we win, you know, let's say we won all six and we put a new school board on there that isn't crazy and actually has some respect for their responsibilities. Well, then there's going to be a new fight. And what is that new fight? That is one oversight, getting parents a seat at the table. You'd be amazed at all the special interests that have the ability to influence policy at the local level, right? But also at the state level. You know, when, once you build up an organization that has influence, what do you do to make sure at the state level, the policies that are coming out are, you know, pro meritocracy, pro individualism. And I think one of the things we've been talking a lot about is transparency. And you've got all these, we're not doing CRT, we're not doing this, you've got to send FOIAs, we'll put the stuff online. Put all the materials online, put the teacher trainings online. If you're not doing it, then there's not going to be a problem. If if you are, well, then I guess you're not going to agree with with transparency. Uh, but as far as nationally, I think, you know, kind of this conversation is developing the playbook, developing that playbook that, you know, we can go county by county and say, here's how you do it. Almost a resource, um, a resource for these parents that are looking to build organizations. Right. Like you've got company consultants and private consultants that help, you know, build businesses. Well, this is a, a resource where we will help you connect you with the lawyers, connect you with um, the ability to send out press lists, connect you with, you know, various people that are experts in, in this field and really, you know, keep it grassroots. I don't think having a giant organization that's going in everywhere is, is the answer here. I think having a resource that allows these organizations to pop up organically, but in a professional, effective way is, is the way forward. Yes, indeed. And uh, you guys in Loudoun County are uniquely equipped, given the uh, demographics there, to help create some of these kind of things and engage people that are super uh, sort of already engaged on this level, consultants, professionals, creating businesses, etc. Funny story about transparency. I called my uh, principal at my kid's high school about one of their programs. And I said, uh, well, I'd love to sit in on one of these sessions. No. What do you mean? No, I'm paying you to teach my kids what I want you to teach them. Can I come to the session? No. Well, I guess my kids won't be coming. Transparency. If you're afraid of transparency, then you are obviously part of the problem. I'm a former executive director of multiple different charter school districts uh, in Washington, DC. And each charter school is its own local education agency on par legally with Loudoun County school system. Okay. Legally, we hold the same exact position in the whole federal education structure. And we built our school building with windows in every classroom. Every single one, giant picture frame windows, picture windows, so that anybody can observe any classroom at any time. And we told the teachers and the kids to expect observation from anyone at any time. Okay. They're fine with that because they weren't doing anything shady. It's the people who say they have to have the door closed and the blinds drawn that you should be most suspicious of. And these folks won't let parents attend. They don't reveal the sources. They don't reveal the documents. They don't conduct any transparency, which is them revealing to all of us how they feel about what they're doing themselves. They know it's wrong. They, they know do. And wrong. you know, what's, 
What's the argument against transparency? Exactly what you said. We're, we've got something to hide. You know, they'll say, oh, well, it's going to cost too much money. It's going to take too much time. You guys are spending millions of dollars a year on these equity consultants that are making billions of dollars a year from the taxpayers. You can't take some of that money and say, well, this stuff is so great that we're doing. We want to show everybody. Right, right. Well, and I think the uh, we're about ready to wrap this up here, but I think one of the 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 ideas that is just giving me the most problem is that they just have no interest in collaboration. They have no interest in exploration, discussion, debate. There's no criticism. There's no powerful calculation. These are people supposedly of science, of men of letters, as it were, who are supposed to be taking an approach that is fair and balanced and is something that um, we all agree on because it's a public school. Like when people push back on the idea that, that you're allowed to use government to affect what is being taught in school. What do you mean? What do you mean? You can't use government to t dictate what's being taught in schools. The government exists for the people, by the people, the schools are by the government. Therefore the schools are for the people, by the people. How the hell else do we get to decide what we teach? The government decides. Anyway, I'm hot. I'm an educator. I'm a parent. I live in this area. I know all these people. It's all very personal, not the people personally, but you know what I mean? It's all very personal to me, just as it is to you. Uh, Christopher Rufo has an extensive network. If you're not already in touch with him, let me know. And I'd be happy to make the connection. There are a number of organizations that are trying to do what you're doing uh, and exist to support people just like you and your groups. If you're not in touch with Chris, let me know. I'll make a direct personal connection. He would love to support you guys in your efforts. Anything else that you want to say to the people out there? Any place you want to drive them? Do you guys need money? Do you need signatures? Where yeah. should people go? What is, this is it. This is your call to action, bro. What, what do you got? So, so I would say for, for signatures, go to the website. We'll have events. If you're living in Loudoun County, you want to sign the recall petition. We will post events on the page that you can get to. As far as fundraising, we've got our donation platform on there. Why, in, regardless of where you are, if you're in Loudoun County, if you're in California, or if you're in you know Nebraska, I, you know get, I get asked, well, why should we donate money to Loudoun County? And I go back to that Lexington and Concord thing. If you don't, if we don't put up a fight in Lexington and Concord at Bunker Hill, you know, there's not going to be a Declaration of Independence. There's, there's not going to be Soga. There's not going to be Yorktown. There's not going to be a Constitution. There's not going to be the United States of America. So if we're able to do what we need to do here. We are going to be the spark that lights a fire across the country. Amen to that. Loudoun County is a prominent county in the capital of the United States of America. A lot of stuff that happens in D.C. is bellwether for the rest of the nation. This is included uh, in that. So there is reason to support it if you're from out of state. If you are against... <laughs> manipulation of parents, if you're against secrecy in education, if you're against lack of transparency, if you're against school board meetings being shut down as riots just because people disagree with you, if you're against any of the CRT or any of this crap, throw 20 bucks their way, okay? Help them get this thing sorted so that we can build a blueprint for what is going to be a long-term battle. None of this is going to be resolved in the next day, week, month, or even year. Probably going to take a decade. So we need everyone to come together. Ian, thank you so much. I really appreciate your time and energy. It's been great talking to you. Thank you so much for your energy and effort that you're putting into uh, Loudoun County. And uh, thanks so much for coming on the show, man. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having me. It was a blast. All right, my pleasure. Guys. Uh, hit like, share this thing, send it out. You know it's going to be suppressed. It's always being suppressed. You got to put it in your Twitter, send it to your friends. You got to put it in your email, send it to your friends. You got to post it to your Facebook. It is not going to get out otherwise. Follow me on Twitter at Jack Murphy Live. Follow Ian at Ian D. Pryor on Twitter. Get out there and make a difference, guys. I appreciate it. And until the next time, we're out. Thanks. On this show, we're driven by curiosity. We want to chart a path forward best people, best conversations. We're on a journey and it's just getting started.